Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, I can. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Kelvin. Good afternoon, Mr. Emmanuel. Good thank afternoon. you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to your audience. Thank you. So I've just yes. sent them a message that we would be starting now because we are going to be starting at 3.30 on the dot. Um, um, okay, so let me just introduce myself. My name is Juliana Obo-Joseph, but I'm popularly known online as Juliana Imam. I'm a legal practitioner um, and I am specializing. I, I specialize in intellectual property and entertainment law. I've interviewed Mr. Kelvin before on another program that I usually have on sports law. And so he'll be talking about sports law today. And while I was going through my Instagram, I saw something about e-sports law. And that was how I saw Mr. Emmanuel. And I thought that it would be very good to also hear about e-sports. So today we'll be hearing from Mr. Kelvin and Mr. Emmanuel about sports and about e-sports. And then the mentees will go ahead to present. Um, so we just have two of the groups presenting. One is presenting on sports and the other one presenting on television law, which will be happening um, by 4.30. But for this particular session, we're excited to have you. And I'm hoping that the mentees will be um, um, very engaging in this discussion. So, we'll, so I'd like to encourage everyone that is here, if it's possible, please put on your video. If it's not possible, fine. Some have already dropped their questions. So um, when we get to the Q&A session, we'll answer the questions. Um, Gypsy Mentorship and Internship Program. Okay, Mrs. Uche is here. She's one of our wonderful men, um, mentors. She has been here from the second quarter up till now and she's someone that by the time she listens to what has been said already based on her years of practice she always has something to add to to even make the discussion richer so you're welcome ma thank you thank you ma so going forward um this is a mentorship program for lawyers and young lawyers and people who are interested generally in ip and um we have 18 mentees for this quarter. Um, more will be joining us as we go along. So for the presentation today, um, we have a group that is presenting on sports law. Please, are you here and are you ready for your presentation? So the group that is supposed to present on sports law, let me know if you're here and if you're ready to present. Okay, so for adventure, they are not here or they are not ready. I think we'll just go straight into the discussion. So we'll be starting with the eSports. Our guest for today is Emmanuel Oyela King. He is passionate about empowering the African youth to bring about development on the African continent and also on the global stage while strategically driving the narrative straight from an African perspective. Dedicated towards growing the gaming and esports space in Nigeria, he founded League of Extraordinary Gamers, LXG Esports in 2016 and Esport Nigeria in 2017. LXG is the organizer of Nigeria's biggest and most prestigious mobile esport land event, Legend Extraordinary Club Open, LECO. He currently serves as the founding president, Electronic Sports Federation of Nigeria, ESFA. He is co founder of executive committee member, he is co founder and executive committee member of the Africa Esports Championship, AEC, with the World Esports Consortium, WASCO. He serves as president of the Africa Advisory Board and member of the presidential board. In recognition of his continuous, in recognition of his contribution to the growth of esports in Nigeria and Lagos, he was recently appointed as chairperson of the Lagos State Esports Association, a full-fledged sport association inaugurated by the Lagos State Sports Commission under the, auspicious, the auspices of the Lagos State Government. Mr. Emmanuel, you are welcome. We're excited to listen to you. You have 15 minutes. 
You're welcome, sir. Um, thank you, Juliana. Thank you for having me um, here to speak to these wonderful people. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to be here. Um, I noticed that, Juliana, you had quite a, mouth, quite a mouthful there, having to call all of the names <laughs> and read them out. Okay, don't worry. Maybe what time you get used to it. Okay, so um, my name is Emmanuel, and um, I'll be talking to us today about um, the concept of esports, esports and gaming, basically. What is esports? Esports is simple. It's just um, electronic sports, uh, but it goes beyond that. Gaming in itself has to do with electronic games. So that for those of you who are familiar with traditional sports like football, boxing, swimming, basketball, you know, and the likes, you know, these are the things you do physically on the pitch. And as of today, we refer to them as traditional sports. So in the sports world, that's what we call the regular sports like football. We call them um, traditional sports. And so they have their electronic um, equivalents in terms of FIFA, NBA 2K for basketball. So Juliana, so let me quickly ask, um, are we in any way familiar with some of the um, games that are out there today? I don't know if we're familiar. I think you should just speak as if you are speaking to people that don't understand. Oh, East. okay. Okay. I, I needed to know that. Uh, but one thing I know that I'm sure about is that virtually everybody here plays video games. If you don't play on the console, if you don't play on your PC, at least you play on your phone. If you play Candy Crush, you are playing a video game. Yes. You know, if you play, is it Monkey Run or what's it, what's it called now? You're playing video games. They all make they all make a part of the ecosystem. So like I was saying, the same way you have football, tennis, and the likes, you also have the equivalent in their electronic formats so that I could have a, a football game where there will be 11 versus 11 and I'm playing and I'm controlling the characters in that game. So that the same way Ronaldo will take a shot and it will go into the net or you messy and everybody will be, you know, jumping for joy. It's the same way also I could use the character of Ronaldo to take a shot, it goes into the net and people are celebrating. Um, that is video games. Electronic, sorry, esports is the advanced part of video games. Esports is where you have the competitive part of gaming. Ideally, esports is defined as a competitive sport between registered um, athletes, we call them athletes today, who compete for a prize. You know, so maybe there's money to be won. And then you have a contract with a team. So the same way you would have a Ronaldo or Messi unveiled and signed on to a club. Today also we have players who are registered and they have a contract and they are signed to a club. So when that club wants to play, they go to represent their club in a contest against another club, you know, or another team. And so these guys have become full-time gamers. They play full-time, um, they have their regiment, they have their coaches, they have their managers, they have their physiotherapists, they have their trainers, you know. They train, they go to the gym, they spend time on their consoles to, um, to fine-tune their skills just so that they can always be, you know, ahead of the game. Because um, you see so many people out there today, there are thousands of people, what did I say thousands? There are millions, hundreds of millions of people who play video games today. So you cannot come out and say you want to play against them without being prepared because people are at different levels, you know? So there's that training session that happens, everybody's training, just wanting to be um, the best. Talking about video games in Nigeria, it is not something new to us. Um, I personally, this is a 30th year that I started playing video games. I started playing yeah. in 1991. And what we didn't have then was the concept of esports as it is today. Um, video games have been there for the earliest recorded 
gaming contest was sometime in 1981 or 82. I think it was a university in the US, Stanton, but I stand corrected on that, you know. But when you talk about Nigeria, um, people have been playing video games, you know. The Game Boys, I don't know if anybody here will know the Game Boy device. There was a, a device called Game Boy, you know, that was when I started with, you know. And then there was Sega, there was Atari, there was um, PS1. Everybody must have heard somewhere or seen somewhere um, what is called PlayStation or PS for short. So PS1 came and many people jumped on it. It became more and more interesting. And you know, as technology was evolving, this equipment also were evolving in their designs and capabilities in the sense that some of them, not some, as of today, all of those devices can actually go online. You can play against somebody in another part of the world. You know, so there's network connectivity, you can collaborate, you can play together as a team. Meanwhile, you are not in the same place. But because you are connected in the online world, you're in the same place virtually. So you can actually approach and play against other people as a team. It is a very interesting um, experience. Um, when you talk about the platforms for playing um, video games, there are so many platforms. Um, we have the console, which is your PlayStation or your Xbox, or maybe your uh, Nintendo Switch. That's for the consoles. There are more consoles coming up, you know, and this will keep happening because it's a big ecosystem. Um, aside the consoles, you also have PC gaming. Some people play on PC. And the general argument out there is that the best platform for playing is on your PC. Because your PC you know, has a lot of um, configuration that is built for you to be able to have a good gaming experience. These games are heavy. The publishers actually go a long way to make sure that they design something really beautiful. You know, and so they can be very demanding in terms of resources. But if you have the right um, PC, you know, your graphic card is good, your processor is excellent, you have good memory and all of those, you will have a solid experience on PC. So the best players in the world actually play on, on PCs. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so... Um, that's number two. Aside PC, you also have mobile gaming, where you can play your mobile phone. Remember, I talked about technology. It's been evolving, and, it's, and as it's been evolving, it's also impacting positively on the gaming world. So that the things your phones can do today, they couldn't do it many years ago. You know, so you have a lot more powerful phones that can take the demands of the mobile version of these games. So that on your phone today, you can play FIFA, you can play NBA 2K, you can play uh, PUBG Mobile, you can play Call of Duty, you can play all of those guys. You know, you will have the phones that can do that. And when you talk in terms of popularity, uh, mobile games is number one today for obvious reasons. Because for your console, you have to get your console, you have to get your controller, you have to get your... PC, where you're going to be viewing the game from. You have to get your network connectivity if you want to play online. You know, it can be daunting for some people. And then again, the price. Consoles come today at about $500, $600, $700, you know. And with the um, currency, currency exchange effects in, in Nigeria today, the more it increases, the more the final cost of those consoles become. Same thing goes for the PC. You need a high-end PC to be able to play um, your video games well on a professional level. And we're talking of PCs you will get for like maybe $5,000. You get for $5,000, $6,000. I mean, only few people can do that, you know. But the surest and the most convenient is your mobile device. Because on your mobile device, you have just one instrument that does everything. You can download the game on it. 
you need data, your SIM card is in there. Or if you want to use your Wi-Fi, you know, and the controls also are virtual so that on your phone, you can do stuff, you know, you can, you don't need an external um, device. You can if you want, but the makers of the game have also created virtual controllers on the game so you can play easily. You know, and it's just one device and everything you want to do is on it. You know, I could hook up my headset to my phone. So, I, so I'm playing wirelessly, you know. So because of the availability of smartphones as of today, those who can buy the iPhones and the Samsungs can buy the Techno and the Infinix, you know, still be able to have a fairly good experience, you know. So we have a lot more people on the mobile phone platform who are doing big things, you know, compared to those um, who play on PC and on console, they are a smaller number, you know. And the projection is that the mobile phone space will continue to dominate every other space, you know, in terms of the platforms where the games are played. Um, so I'll quickly talk about Africa also. Um, when you talk about um, African countries that are into esports and gaming, Nigeria is not number one. I must um, quickly um, state that South Africa has a lot more um, organized and good quality um, esports and gaming scene. Nigeria also is not far behind. If you ask me, I'll put Nigeria maybe top four or five because we see some of the things happening in North Africa in places like Egypt, uh, Morocco, Tunisia, you know, Ivory Coast, yes. I must not fail to mention Ivory Coast. Those, they, they are doing great things there also, you know. But of course, Nigeria is not, like I said, not far behind. Uh, there was an event I held, I think it was last year. No, 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 it was this year. Um, by the PUBG Corporation, they organized a tournament for Africa to get those that would go for the um, world championship, so to speak. And it was a Nigerian team that came first, you know. And that Nigerian team has been known to be very good in that particular um, game. And so Nigerians are doing pretty, pretty, pretty well, you know. And um, what I'm envisaging is the same way we have seen the entertainment industry blossom, the same way we have seen Nollywood blossom, the same way we have seen the fashion industry doing big things today, the same way we have seen or we are seeing the music industry in Nigeria doing big things today. It's the same way the gaming industry also will do great things and put this country on the map, you know, and bring a lot of respect to Nigeria. Culturally today, Nigeria is number one in Africa. When you talk about music, movies, Nollywood is watched all over Africa, you know. Nigerian music stars are sought after. We see the biggest stars in the world like Pop Daddy, Chris Brown, you know, wanting to do collabs with the likes of Whiskey, with Bonner Boy, with Davido, you know, it tells you that what we are doing here is big. And so these guys love it. And so we're also beginning to see projection in the gaming world also, where Nigerian um, players and content creators are beginning to, I mean, make their mark in Africa and on the global stage. You know, as of today, there are so many inquiries, so many conversations that are going on about are coming to invest in Nigeria, about partnering with Nigerian esports and gaming organizations, you know, because people are seeing the prospects. And if you look at the fact that the numbers are here also, we are over 200 million, you know, and um, according to statistics, you know, the young people between the ages of 18 and 35 make up more than 65% of our population in Nigeria, you know. And the amazing thing, again, is for those who play video games, they are not, they are even beyond that, um, demography of, of 18 to 35, you know, I'm in my 40s, I still play video games, and I know many people who do that also, and also there are people who are even not up to 18 years, and they're all into video games, people as young as eight, so you would see that the percentage of those in that category of um, video gamers, you know, actually, when you look at Nigeria's population, we'll be talking at about 70 something percent to 80 percent so that's a huge huge number you know so that you have several millions of people who are into video games one video game or the other now 
there are so many video games in the world today. There are tens of thousands of video games, you know, but of course there are the ones that are more popular than the others. Nigeria, naturally, we have FIFA, we love football. So the same thing is happening in the video games world also, where we have many Nigerians who are fans of FIFA, who play FIFA. There is NBA 2K. NBA 2K is the um, basketball equivalent, you know, for video games. There is PUBG, there is Call of Duty. Call of Duty. So th there are some games that are available on all platforms. They are on console, they are on PC, they are on mobile. You know, there are some that are strictly on just one platform. There's what is called crossplay. Crossplay is where I can play with somebody who is not on my platform. So I play on a console, for instance, let's say I play on PlayStation and somebody is playing on Xbox. You know, if both of us are able to play, then that is crossplay. Um, if somebody is playing on a PC and I'm playing on my console, that is crossplay. You know, so there's a lot happening in that space. There's a lot of revenue generation opportunities, there's a lot of career opportunities. And um, you don't necessarily have to be a gamer to be involved in the gaming industry. I need to put that out there clearly. You don't necessarily have to go and carry a controller and say you want to play before you can be involved in the industry. There are so many ways to be involved. Like I always tell people, when you look at those that are into Nollywood today, we see the stars, we see, we see the KOKs, we see the Ramsey Noirs, we see the Akian Popos, you know, those are the people we know. But would you believe that in the whole Nollywood industry, these guys are actually a small percentage of the um, Nollywood ecosystem, you know? So who are the other people? The producers, the directors, those who handle lighting, those who handle makeup, those who handle wardrobe, you know, those who handle different things. You know, they make the larger bulk of the whole ecosystem. And it's the same thing for esports and gaming also. So the players are the ones that are seen, that everybody gets to know. But there's a whole host of people in the background doing stuff. You know, you, oh, okay. I think um, I've exceeded my time. Well, I'm, I'm going to take a break now, you know, I'm just um, wait for the next directive on what to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Emmanuel. It was very obvious that you were talking very passionately. Personally, I don't, um, well, I think I play games based on how you explained it, like all those Candy Crush and all those things. So I think, yes, that I fall under the gamers. Um, but I don't even know if that's a word, but uh, <laughs> that's, it. <laughs> that's it, right? So thank you so much for the explanation. From a legal perspective, I'll just say that um, IP will definitely come into what you have just discussed, the law, oh, yes. contracts, privacy issues, mm -hmm. trademark brands, and um, different things will still come into it. So that's one of because most of the people Not here real. Are, they are in already. Good, good. So um, coming up after you is a legal practitioner and he's a sports lawyer. So he would be bringing um, another perspective to this discussion. Um, our guest for today is <laughs> Kelvin Omojin. <laughs> he's an expert in the area of sports law, specializing in governance and administration. He's a principal associate at Sports House LP, and his work experience includes a compliant and regulatory role with the Nigerian Professional Football League, and he has been a member of the disciplinary committee of the Nigeria Football Federation. He also serves on the, the editorial board, Africa Subdivision in, of Law in Sports and Online Sports Law Publication. Okay, so he, Graduated from Delta State University. He was called to the Nigerian Bar in 2006 and has since gained broad based legal experience from both the private and public sector, having worked as an associate at Eustin Peters and Co., and also with the Delta State Ministry of Justice as a senior state counsel and public prosecutor. He holds a master's degree in sports law from Nottingham Trent University and has a number of published articles on sports law 
including the legal framework for sports development in Nigeria, dispute resolution in Nigeria football, the need for a national dispute resolution chamber, both published in the African Sports Law Journal, as well as why Africa urgently needs to come to commercial commerci commercialize its sports sector, published in lawinsports.com. He also speaks and lectures on sports law, some of which include panel moderator at the World Intellectual Property Day Forum, Reach for Gold, Intellectual Property and Sports organized by Luko and Oyebo Day in collaboration with the American Business Council, Lagos Chamber of Commerce International Arbitration Center, and the anti-counterfeiting collaboration of Nigeria on 26 April 2019, Sports Law, the Untapped Nigerian Human and Legal Resources, a, leg a lecture delivered at the inaugural Sports Law Clinic at Obafemi Awolowo University, Ilei Fair on 28 June 2019, Legal Issues in African Football as part of the International Panel at a webinar organized by lawinsports.com on 25 July 2019, training, compensation, and solidarity mechanism, benefits for grassroots football clubs, a presentation at the capacity building workshop for Delta State football coaches during the Royal Cup at Efurun Delta State on September, 20, September 2019, introduction to sports law practice in Nigeria, a lecture delivered at Sports Law Masterclass organized by Discovery Sports and Sports, Sports Licitors in Lagos on 12th March, 2020. You're welcome, Mr. Kelvin. Thank you so much for joining us today. You have about 15 minutes to tell us about Sports Law. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Eliana. Good evening or good afternoon, everyone. Um, kudos to Mr. Yelaki. It was nice listening to him. In fact, uh, you have inspired me to take my gaming more seriously. Um, all those um, back then, university, all those sleepless nights playing, or playing FIFA. I think I, I need to take it a notch higher now. Uh, so um, that said, we'll be talking about sports law. Sports law. Um, more traditional, like uh, Rano said, uh, more um, beyond or before the electronic parts, you know, the more traditional, you know, aspects of types of sports on the field or play on the track, you know, so that's uh, more of what my, my area is about. But we'll be talking of sports law, you know, and um, it's going to be brief. We're just going to um, talk about a couple of um, uh, things, a couple of things that you should know, you know, okay, to be abreast with the concept of sports law. First of all, what, when you say sports law, what is sports law? It's um, important to understand the, let me say dichotomy, because there are people who believe that sports law is a substantive area of law. And there is another school of thought that believes that it is just sports and the law. But whatever the case, whatever you believe, or whatever school of thought you belong to, the basic thing, is that sports or sports law, however you choose to describe it, involves you know, an intersection between sports and different aspects of law. So um, to put it in context, if you're someone like me who has always loved sports growing up and then you want to get into sports law, the law for sports is not enough. You, know, you actually need to be grounded in different aspects of law. Like um, Juliana will tell you, IP, it's a huge part of it, intellectual property, you know. Um, when you, uh, many people would have heard that, okay, Lionel Messi has moved from Barcelona to PSG now. Of course, he left a contract at Barcelona, signed another one at PSG. So fundamentally, we're talking of contracts, you know. Then as an employee, as a professional footballer, paid in, paid a salary, you know. You, you're talking of employment, labor law employment. Then there is often an agent or an intermediary who helps to broker the deal. You're talking of agency, you know. You watch sports on TV. You're talking of media law, you know, broadcasts. You know, there are different aspects to it. Even in terms of um, 
taught physical injuries and all liability, you know. So you just understand that sports law has to do with sports and different aspects of law. So it's important to have a fair understanding of what employment law is all about, what contract law is all about, importantly also what IP is all about, etc. And um, also there's this concept that is good to, to, to uh, be aware of when you talk of the specificity of sports, because in as much as sports law intersects with this, these different aspects of law, they are the unique features of sports and sports law, you know, which what it implies is that in addition to your knowledge of the principles involved in contract law, intellectual property law, you need to have an understanding of the legal framework of sports itself. What are the specific rules? For instance, if you have a, if an individual has a dual citizenship, of course, it means you generally have the rights of a citizen in either of those countries. But when it comes to sports, you find that you are only able to represent one country in most cases for your for, for your lifetime. So there are rules, you know, and these rules are based on the peculiar feature of peculiar features of sports. You know, so it's important to understand its own specific regulatory framework. And there are differences from sport to sport. You know, but there are many principles that you know, cut across. So that is one other concept to you know be abreast of the when you talk about the specificity of sports. What are the unique features? So, in as much as you have an appreciation of different aspects that really of law that relate to so intersect with sports, it's important to be grounded about the peculiar principles when you talk about um, sports or sports law. And um, another of one of those such features, you know, is the system of dispute resolution. You might have heard people say that sports matters do not go to court or are not taken to court and not litigated upon. You know, that I like to um, describe it as an arbitration clause, as it were, or an arbitration agreement. That is how it operates. So the basic idea there is that when you have matters involving sports, technical matters, you know, there is usually the rules, the regulations of, of sports at the elite level usually have provisions that such disputes are taken to sports tribunals because there you have the just like arbitration you know it, it requires expertise so at such tribunals you have people who have the expertise the knowledge you know of the technical issues involved in that dispute and who are able to give you a sport specific resolution of that dispute but it is important to understand that this applies to sports matters sports disputes not general or other kinds of disputes. For instance, if um, a, I like to use football a lot because it's something I'm passionate about and particularly here in Nigeria, it's something that most of us can most easily relate to. So you take a football player who is being owed salaries by his club or who has a grievance with his club based on the terms of his contract or terms of his employment. In as much as it has occurred in the sporting landscape, it is basically an employment matter. So even in the in this case now the football regulations, you see that they recognize that yes yeah, that is an employment dispute. So nothing stops a player in that situation from taking his his grievance to a civil court or in our case now which would be the national industrial court for employment disputes. So um, that's that's something you know to really understand the system of dispute resolution, and that's why you have um, bodies like. Generally, the global level, the court of arbitration for sports. You know, you have um, in football, this resolution chamber, in other sports too, they have their own sports specific tribunals. Then you have um, some that are cover matters from sports to sports. How, um, like, for instance, in um, Kenya, you know, they have their own arbitration system set up by, by the government, largely, you know, that handles sports disputes. So, where you don't want to take your disputes to, civil courts we know the shortcomings time cost and all you have the you're able to take it to a sports specific tribunal who have the expertise and understand the nuances in the industry and help to resolve the dispute most efficiently 
Then um, something else um, I'd like to talk about is the autonomy of, of sports governing bodies. You know, um, the Nations Cup, the African Cup of Nations is coming up in January. And of course, Nigeria, like other countries, are participating. But what you, you need to understand beyond, you know, behind the scenes is that in football, now where you have the Nigeria Football Federation, they are the representative, representative body or the body that administers and regulates sports in the country. So in as much as it is the Nigeria national team, it is regulated by the Nigeria Football Federation. So it is the NFF, the Nigeria Football Federation, that is a member of FIFA, not Nigeria, as it were. And I like to explain it on the basis of it just being an association. You know, it's just that the magnitude of sport now it has you know significant social and economic impact and um, global significance that we tend to look at it beyond what it actually is. So just like you have a um, Rotary Club, you have a um, Rotary Club in Lagos, a branch in Lagos, a branch in Port Harcourt, and then you have the international one, you know, that's just how it operates with sports. You have the International Federation, you know, that governs the, the sport globally. Then in each country, the geographical space, you have their sub associations in that continental level and at national level. But of course, because of the sport is now big business, as they say, and rightly so, because of this impact, you know, the more and more attention is being paid to sport, and rightly so. Even governments, it's, sport is a, is, a, is a tool, you know, it's, it's massive now. So even governments, you know, in their roles of, you know, social, make uh, political objectives, social e objectives, economic objectives, we realize that sports by employing people, you know, by fostering unity togetherness, the educational, you know, this is sport, in, when Super Eagles are playing is when Nigeria is most united. You probably have heard that before. You know, this significance, you know, makes it attractive to everyone. And it now has educational impact, social impact, economic impact. So that is why sometimes there is a gray area between the sports self-regulation and national laws. But of course, in Europe, they have developed the um, legal principle that, insofar as sports, you know, constitutes an economic activity, it is subject to national law. So if I'm playing sports, you know, and earning a living from it, it's my I'm, I'm employed. The, the fact that I'm in, I'm an employee. Legally speaking, that sport and terms of my employment must conform, conform to um, national national laws. I think those are basically some some key key things to you know to to understand or to appreciate. And uh, for me, this is more about maybe if there are any questions now, taking them to see like what you want to know, and then we do can discuss further on, on these issues. Okay, sir. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Kelvin, for explaining the dynamics in sports law and um, whether it's sports law or um, law of sports or sports in law and all that. Um, thank you so much for the explanation and for giving us a practical insight into sports law. So we'll be going into Q and A, but before the Q and A, I would like to call blessing to give that if she's still here yes for her to give a five minutes presentation on esports law and then we just move straight into questions her presentation is supposed to be on the relevance of ip to esports blessing are you ready yes ma'am hello ma can you hear me yes i can hear you okay please you can just okay ahead for five minutes. All right, Ma. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Lesson Uchuma, and I'll be making a presentation on eSports law for good two. I'll just go straight to the presentation. Now, eSports is the short form for electronic sports. Electronic sport has to do um, competitive video gaming at the professional levels. 
it is mm. at a professional level, sorry, it is when um, video game players come together, they play the video games in front of fans. Sometimes they may be here mm. in the physical or it may be virtual fans. And then sometimes these fans can even place bets on who will win the game or who will lose or whatever the case is. So in short, we can say that um, electronics was a competitive video gaming. Now, um, the area of esports it has not been um, widely delved into by many countries and all, but um, in Asia, it, it has already been recognized as a professional sport. And America also recognizes esports players as professional. Now, the esports industry globally is worth billions of dollars. In fact, in 2019, it was speculated to have been worth 1.1 billion dollars however there are no um specific um regulations or legislation for esports so we have other um legislations under sports law contract law gaming law and intellectual property laws regulating the um the field of esports we also have certain um bodies that also regulate esports we have the international esports federation the esports integrity coalition and the world esports association in nigeria we have the nigerian esports federation now we'll also be talking about the relevance of um ip to esports now we cannot overemphasize the relevance of ip to esports in fact i think majority of the laws that govern esports that video gaming and everything that's to do with um computers not all shall have to do with um ip laws so we'll have them in cases such as video game characters and um, music featured on the video games and we have them in issues like trademarks and the rest for instance there are some there are some um there are some um for instance when we talk about um trademarks there are some there are some marks that will help you differentiate between certain games and others and if those trademarks are not protected it means that competitors in the esports world can actually feel because a lot of times these things happen um copy um similar trademark designs or things like that for instance we know that there are very two popular football games we have the fifa and we have the PS, the Pro Evolution Soccer, and there are things that differentiate them such that fans are able to tell which one, which one is um, FIFA and which one is PS. When we also talk about um, um, music, yes, on the video, on the on the video games, um, we'll notice that many video games have theme music alongside with them. These theme music are also protected under copyright laws. We also have for um copyright for featured content there are many games that have specific storylines for instance let, um, if we look at a game like let me say temple run yes there are stages and it, the the game is like is a story so sometimes or many times these specific storylines are also protected such that for instance if 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 certain group of people want to make it into a movie like people usually do, they'll have to take um, permission from the creators of such um, games. Now, like we have always been seeing from the beginning of this class, that one of the major reasons for protecting intellectual property is for is so that the creators and inventors can actually benefit economically from their creations and inventions. So I think that's one of the um, biggest reasons why IP regulate esports because um, um, the players, the creators, the inventors, if if there are no IP laws protecting their their intellectual property, they will not be able to have enough um, or yes, enough economic gain from their creation and inventions. Now we know that the um, field of e-sports e is growing. In fact, I believe that in years to come or very soon, e-sports will actually be rec recognized as one of the games that will be played in the Olympics. And even though I know it's still going in Nigeria, I know that a lot of people will keep delving into it. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Blessing, for the presentation and for the perspective that you brought um, to it. So we'll go straight into the Q&A. So the Q&A is going to run in this format. It will be like marathon question, and then the mentors present will then 
um, go for the answers. So um, Divine has some questions. Ineka has some questions. Humomot has some questions. So you can just unmute yourself and ask your questions. Okay, so good afternoon, please Divine. Go ahead, please, thank you. Okay, so my question, um, the first of which I would like to ask is, in a country like Nigeria, how can esports be well appreciated like other aspects of IT? And what are the things that we can put in place, especially as it is obvious that esports is new in the Nigerian legal system? That's question one. I don't know if I can write the second one. Yes, and please. question two, since esports is an individual or team based activity, how can a nation like Nigeria appropriate it for national benefit rather than individual gain? I think that again, since esports is an individual or team based activity, how can a nation like Nigeria appropriate it for national benefit rather than individual gain? That we all for now. Okay. Thank you, Divine. So we'll move to Neka, um, Neka, and the uh, so, Sorry, somebody taking note of the questions. I think that the mentors are supposed to take note of it. Okay, okay. At the end. Good evening. Right. Okay. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Kelvin. Thank you, uh, Mr. Manuel, for the insightful lecture. I have questions here written down. One, what is the significance of um, sports law in Nigeria? And what are the categories of sports covered by our sports laws? Then another question is, are there prerequisites to becoming a sports lawyer? And then um, the third one is how well is sports law thriving in Nigeria? And what are sports contracts? Thank you. Okay. Mr. Kelvin, please, did you get all the questions? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Good evening. My name is Umama. So my first question is, what is this? And why is it, because, for example, an ice dance, which is performing a competition, not qualified for a corporate protection, while a sports performer choreographed sports protected by in Nigeria, where there are no laws covering its sports, how are, the, how are the rights of developers and players really protected? Thank you. Okay, so I think. Um... We can open the floor up. Does anyone has a question aside from these people who have already asked? Okay, I can see Busola, Ayodele, um, Rita, Blessed, Momot. Okay, yes, that's all the question for now. Who? Okay, Blessed, please, you can go ahead. Momot's question is in the chat section in case. You want to do okay. Go ahead, blessed. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, sir. Um how uh, I don't really want to present this question now. How how lucrative is sports sector to a lawyer? That's just what you want to ask, man. Like in terms of income, like how does it feel for him? Okay, thank you. So I guess we we'll just go straight into the answer. That, um, any of the mentors can start. Okay, um, I'm not an expert when it comes to sports, so I'll leave that for Kelvin. I watch football a lot, quite all right, but when it comes to the law, I don't know. Nah, nah. I'm not, I'm the, I'm not, I don't have any information in that area. So um, I'll take the first question and it has to do with ISP, sorry, IP in esports. So people invest a lot into developing games. Now, there are two different um, stakeholders. 
there are the game developers and there are the game publishers okay so if i was a game developer now i'm the one that will come and write the codes put the game together and i have a finished product and then the publishers are the ones that will publish it market it do all the sales of course there will be an agreement you know revenue revenue share and all of those so these guys also want to protect their interests and make sure that their products are used in the right way royalties and all of those things they don't take they don't joke with them so for if you were, if you were to run a tournament today there are rules there are terms and conditions you know for instance for fifa if you want to run an event you know, there are different categories. There's a community license. That's what is called community license, where you can get that license and you can run your event. But of course, there are terms and conditions that you cannot go beyond. If you do, they will come after you with the law. You know, there'll be infringement and it will come after you. There are other categories where if you want to do an event, you cannot give a prize money above a certain amount, $10,000. You know, there are some materials you cannot use. There are some you can use. So all of those things are there. So it's always important that before you begin to publicize, before you decide on what game you want to take um, um, take part in, sorry, you want to run a tournament on, get to know. And the, the terms are different per publisher. So for instance, when you hear EA Sports, EA Sports are the publishers. They are not the developers. They publish the game. And so you want to understand what the rules and regulations are. What, am I, what can I do? What can I not do? So that you don't go foul of their requirements. You do so, they can come after you. You know, So you need to check per game. And if I say that there are tens or thousands of games, it means that the rules will be different per game. So you need to check what applies before you embark on that. That is how um, um, IP is protected. You know, there are laws, you know, that you also have to adhere to. How can we benefit from esports as a nation? I shared a YouTube link um, to everyone in the chat. That was where the Honorable Minister of um, Youth and Sports was talking about the adoption of esports as national sport in Nigeria. What it means is the same status that Nigerian footballers have is the same status now that esports athletes also have. So you can qualify to represent Nigeria and don the green white dream to go and represent Nigeria in another country. Um, there is an event coming up in November in Israel, and we are working hard to see if we can send Nigerian athletes to go and fly the Nigerian flag there. Um, we've taken part in events before now. There was the Afro Caribbean Sports Championship last year, you know, where seven African countries played against seven African countries from the, sorry. Seven African countries against seven countries from the Caribbean. So they were paired with Saint, Saint Lucia. It's an island country in, in, in the Caribbean. And Africa won that event because it was a continent versus continent event. And it was Nigeria that helped Africa win because all other countries in Africa either won one and lost one or lost both. But Nigeria won both games. It was FIFA and Tekken. We won both games. And that was where we gave Africa the edge. Um, I'll come back to respond to the third question on esports, um, maybe shortly after. Thank you. Okay, can we add to? Um, can I go ahead and add to uh, what the what Emmanuel has said? And he's done fantastic work, you know, answering the questions. But let me just add a few comments. So um, the question on how can Nigeria benefit? Sports because these uh, um, sports are played by professionals for a six digit number, they pay tax on it. So, uh, this is where um, a country can benefit, especially in Nigeria, by taxing the players and the tax that they pay on it. And because um, other people who are watching although they're not professionals, there are keen people that they watch with their friends, they engage friends. Some of them watch to improve their skills so that they will be better at the game. And then also the professional players, they wear gears like BMW or some of them in the digital space, we show off the latest model of iPhones and stuff like that. 
these are things that people do and you know to garner interest on like traditional sports where people will just go and then mind you remember esports you don't pay so it's free on like traditional sports where they lock the gate against paying fans so um all of these the interest that people are gonna by being together sharing is also the way that the country can benefit from the brands individual logos i mean do you pay somebody to use their logo so if they are newcomers to the marketplace they can wear you know showcase their logo as um, um a marketing tool and then the question is how can esports be protected Although there is no, like the, um, I think Blessing had mentioned that there is no regulation. Yes, that there are integrity commissions that have to deal with doping and uh, match, uh, match fixing and uh, betting and stuff like that. So through that, you can protect. And, apart, and also, in addition, common law. There are ethics. So if you're a professional player, you don't want to go against human ethics, even though there are no laws, but at least, especially for a corporation, you want to maintain the integrity and not appear to be a bad corporate citizen to a country where you do business. And finally, I think uh, someone asked uh, whether the brand, the, this is recreative to a lawyer. Of course it is because is seen as another aspect of international intellectual property. So the same way you make money representing brands, that's how you represent people who play or people who showcase their brands. Brand owners have seen it as a benefit you know, to grow their brands through young audience that play and buy their gear so that they show us. So from that lawyer, so it's just like any other aspect of intellectual property where you, you have, um, you do work for your brand, represent them, look for counterfeiting issues and see where somebody is using an individual logo. Do you pay for using somebody's logo? So there's a lot of work really to be done from this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Uche, the addition. Okay, Mr. Kelvin, please. Yes, um, okay, thank you. Uh, in fact, let me add one, you know, one way that Nigeria can benefit from esports. You know, it just occurred to me, and I'm thinking, you know, instead of um, pressing laptop, if you are pressing a, a gamepad and making money, you know, if you if you understand what I mean, you know, people who spend time on online committing um, electronic fraud, if you are you are playing electronic games and making money, I think it will, will as a country will be better off, off for it. You know, that's just something that occurred to me. And then, okay, to the questions that are related to sports law, um, Nika asked them um, about significance of sports law in Nigeria. Um, you know, they say that one of the things they always teach is that law is dynamic. You know, as, as things, as society evolves, law must keep up. So just um, like in the criminal law, in criminal law space, for instance, um, as electronic fraud becomes a thing, you need laws relating to electronic activities, you know. So the fact that sport, previously, the days of, um, the, um, um, in the eighties, when sports was basically amateur, people were not being paid, you know, it was different. But now sports is economically significant. So it is just for, you know, for law to, to keep up. So that you you regu it's just about regulation, you know. You don't want want it to be abused, you know. So you just law just has to to keep up. That's the thing. Since sport is significant, law has to you know keep up with it. And then talking of the categories of sports law, um, you have um different. It's just like law. It's it's broad. It's dynamic. So you have different aspects to sports law. You you have the aspects of uh, maybe representing players, clubs, before sports tribunals, contract negotiations, you know, yeah, just anything you can think of it, even commercial activities to broadcast, you know, where maybe a league wants to sign a, a broadcast partnership with, you know, with, with a sponsor or a broadcast company, you are talking of um, the contract. So just since it's, it's a business, any um, commercial activity, the legal aspects you have is relevant, you know, those are categories. Then, 
on the other side of it, when you're talking of law in term, terms of legislation, um, you can talk of what laws relate to sports. You know, in Nigeria, we do not have one comprehensive sports law. You know, but we have a few currently now a few laws that touch on sports. For instance, the National Institute for Sports Act sets up the National Institute for Sports. You have them um, then under the Social Development Act. You know, where it talks about government social, um, economic, uh, social objectives, economic objectives and all. It talks about using sports as a means to achieve those objectives. Then also, I think the closest, the most direct law you have relating to sports is the Nigeria Football Association Act, the NFF, NFA Act. So th those are the two ways I think I, I can answer the question about categories of sports law in Nigeria. Then um, prerequisite to becoming a sports lawyer. You know, I, I, I said at the beginning of the presentation that you, there are different aspects of law that relate or inter, to relate to or intersect with sports. So there is no basic prerequisite. A, a lawyer can be a sports lawyer or a lawyer can work in sports law. For instance, Juliana is an IP lawyer. Tomorrow, um, maybe a football club contacts her and says, uh, we want to register our trademarks. We want to do this and that. You're working for them, you're automatically a sports lawyer. You know, even some of the biggest sports lawyers across the world didn't start out as sports lawyers. They started maybe representing players and clubs and all. So it's all about understanding the aspects that relates to sports in that specific instance, whether it's contract or intellectual property, and then knowing what the sports regulations say in respect of that um, aspect. Then um, how well is how well is sports? Well, I'm not sure I got that. How how well is sports law in Nigeria? I, I don't think I got that properly, but if you could maybe post it, I'll I'll get to it. Then um okay, Humomo asked um okay. What is the difference and why is one sport? Pardon? How profitable is sports law? Like being a sports lawyer, okay, is it okay? How, okay, yes, I think it's similar to the, another question. How lucrative is sports sector for a lawyer? Okay, um, it is hinged on commercialization. That is just it. Because someone would typically only in the commercial space now, you know, someone would typically need a lawyer when. It involves um, money or commercial interests, you get. So, or it's a business, you know, or it's a business. So, when um, when in say Europe now, where sports is big business, of course, then there's money for lawyers. In Africa and Nigeria, sport is not yet commercialized, largely so, you know. So you, it is when these are businesses, you know, of course, anybody who wants to do big business would, of course, want to protect his rights, you know, his interests, and will typically consult a lawyer. So the fact that we have not gotten to that threshold of commercialization is limiting for the look, how, to determine how lucrative sports law is in Nigeria. That is, you know, to be frank. But in Europe and oh, particularly where sports law is, sports is commercialized, you know, it's quite lucrative. But that's not to say it is completely unlucrative in Nigeria. It is developing. It is growing. You know, basic the basic opportunities now relate to working with um, sports federations or some sports clubs or representing maybe players or clubs in some disputes that they might have. And um, compared to what it was some years ago, there are a few law firms now that have sports and maybe sports and entertainment law as practice areas. So one could even get employment in a law firm focused that has them sports law as a practice practice area. But like I said, the good thing is it is involved evolving, it is it is growing. Then um another question, okay, the question by Homo talks about the difference and why one sport, I think give an example of ice dance, will not be protected, whereas another would be. You know, so that's talking about copyright or okay, intellectual property, basically. You know, the thing now is what's intellectual property all about? It's protecting your work, your creativity. So I'm not too familiar with ice dance, but off the top of my head, what I can say is that if a dance routine is not original or is common in that sport, 
it would really be difficult to get any intellectual intellectual property protection for that routine because it's common it's what everybody does let me give an example come back to football again um cristiano ronaldo uh, you know this is celebration where he jumps turns around and you know anywhere you see, anybody you see doing that celebration you say ah, this is cr7 celebration it's not common in the game of football it is unique to him, his, ident his identity so something like that that is original you know his creation it could be trademarked but if it is just taking a free kick and players way before him have been doing it unless he has something a technique that is original you know to him that qualifies for trademark protection because anything that qualifies for for trademark or ip protection even in the sports space pretty sure would get that protection uh, thank you very much Mr. Kelvin, thank you, Mr. Emmanuel, for the presentations on sports law and e-sports law. Thank you for taking our um, questions. We are very grateful for your time. Sincerely, we sincerely appreciate you for um, taking and saying yes to it. That means you care for the next generation and you care this profession should continue moving forward and it should move forward with excellence. Thank you very much. Mr. Shegun Aluko is in the building and he'll be taking us on film and television law. So for Mr. Kelvin and Mr. Emmanuel, if you want to know more about film and television law, please stay and join us. Um, but if you cannot stay, we want to say that we are so grateful and we love you and we are excited that you came and you shared with us. <laughs> Thank you so much. So we'll be going to... Uh, <laughs> to Mr. Shegun Aluko. I know that Mr. Polari has a lot that he wants to say, but let me just hold him because he's like a barber. So when he starts, we just have to pause and listen to him until he's done. So let's just be patient. By the time Mr. Shegun Aluko, and they have the same son name, coincidentally. So I know that he will have a lot of things to say. So um, you're welcome, Mr. Shegun Aluko. Mr. Shegwan Luko is an associate in the Entertainment and Digital Media Practice Group in Shepherd Million Century City Office. His practice focuses on transactional entertainment matters, including rights acquisition, development, first look and overall deals, production, talent deals, ET, that is working for um, actors, writers, directors, producers, and guilds related matters, financing, licensing, and distribution for motion pictures, as well as scripted and unscripted television mm -hmm. produ production. He advises studios, production companies, independent producers, and digital content creation in all aspects related to the creation and exploitation of motion pictures, documentaries, television series, and animated projects. He works with the firm's entertainment clients on corporate matters related to mergers and acquisitions, joint ventures, venture capital, private equity, and corporate finance. Prior to joining Shepard Mullen, he was a business affairs executive with Williams Morris Endeavor, where he collaborated with and counseled literary literary and talent agents on film, television, podcasts, and digital media deals. He started his legal career as an associate at the prestigious Nigerian law firm Alukano Yebade, wow, where he represented clients on corporate matters related to mergers and acquisition, project finance, and general commercial transactions. He also represented clients in finance and general commercial transactions. Shegun also represented clients in intellectual property, including copyrights, trademark, and patent registrations, and portfolio management, and complex commercial litigation mm -hmm. and arbitration matters. He received his LLB from Obafemi Awodowo University, Ileife, Nigeria, and his LLM with entertainment, media, and intellectual property certificate from University of South California Law School. 
Shekun also received his MBA with specialization in finance and entrepreneurship from University of California, Los Angeles, Anderson School of Management. Shekun is also a licensed attorney in Nigeria and a public speaker at events that provides capacity building for artists, talents, and independent producers in the entertainment industry. You're welcome, Mr. Shegun Aluko. You have about 25 minutes to talk about both film and television, though. You're welcome, sir. Yeah, it's great to be here. Can you, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, yes. it's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I do recognize some familiar faces here. Um, my, my, my very you know, good previous boss, Jim Wokocha, uh, is here. So it's it's good to to be in the company of like great people <laughs> thank you so much it's so great to see you i haven't seen you in how many years over 10 years i know yeah <laughs> oh my god anyway today i'm so keen to listen to you because i know when you left you went straight to entertainment law in hollywood so yes. i'm all here. welcome that's great thank so you. nice to see you yeah Likewise. and of course yeah, my very good friend, uh, Folari, I call him Flo. So I'm actually surprised to to see him. I didn't know like he's one of the facilitators of, of this event. So awesome to be like in great company. Uh, well, <laughs> thank you, Flo. Yeah, so the concept of film and, and television law, um, I remember when I took those courses, you know, during my LLM, they just call it like legal issues in film or in motion picture and then legal issues in television um before i left nigeria i didn't really know much about you know television the way it is here in the states um it was more of like movies but i've always wanted to be an entertainment lawyer since high school and um um in university you know for anyone that would listen i was like oh i'm gonna be an entertainment lawyer and um, I remember when I was at Alucard University, you know, I had a mentor, so Sumbo Akintola, who I remember we went there for um, an excursion. It was like, oh, you have to focus on intellectual property law, understand it, and then you definitely have to leave Nigeria and, and go learn it, you know, abroad, uh, which was what I did. Um, so let's talk about motion picture or what people generally talk uh, about as film. Um, before now, it was more of like theatrical, like, you know, movies that get shown in movie theaters. Uh, but then nowadays with the advent of, you know, subscription video on demand platforms like Netflix, Hulu, uh, Disney Plus, HBO Max, there are many movies that just get released on, on those platforms. So we typically like industry term, we'll call them s board movies, but they are still like, you know, motion picture. And then you have television, which, you know, could be uh, scripted television uh, or non-scripted television. So for scripted television, like just think about your favorite, you know, scripted television shows. Uh, whether it suits or, you know, how to get away with murder or whatever the latest and hot uh, television shows nowadays. Um, it's just different in the way those deals are structured and, you know, just because of the longevity of, of the television series, scripted television series. And then you have the non-scripted television, like the one that's very popular in Nigeria right now, you know, when I follow on social media, like the boys um, who wants to be a millionaire or some other, um, you know, format. So it's all about format in the non-scripted space. I know I only have 20 minutes, but it's just very, you know, it's a huge um, business. And it's a, it's, a, it's a huge area of law, you know, when you talk about, uh, these these things, but just to make it you know simple, and I'm sure people will have questions. So, and um, if you have any questions, just you know feel free to interrupt me and you know ask me your questions. So let's talk about film. Um, 
typically all any form of audiovisual content um, it all starts with development so i will ask you to imagine a pyramid you know but then think about it like an in inverse pyramid you know so on top of it you see so many things in development and then how does development happen somebody came up with the idea and we all know that copyright doesn't necessarily protect our ideas it protects the expression of ideas yeah. so let's say somebody you know came up with you know an idea to make a movie you know boy meets girl girl falls in love with boy boy falls in love with girl girl you know boy asks girl out or vice versa and then they fell in love and then they got married so typically um because here in hollywood you have like the studios who pretty much like they finance develop produce and uh um distribute you know movie content or, or film and then you also have the independent you know producers who kind of like just do it on their own and then they sell you know to the studio and all that so let's focus on film right now you're talking about the development process but then so somebody could come up with an idea and write a screenplay and then you know try to set it up with a studio or they want to do it on their home with like independent financier or it could also be that the idea of the movie is based on um an underlying right so let's say a book like for example um i believe ebony live tv is trying to do a movie based on uh the secret lives of baba segi's wives uh by lola shonei uh and they also just uh optioned the rights to a bloomberg newspaper article about the story of osh poppy now those are considered underlying rights so it could Underlying rights could be another movie, it could be a, a book, it could be a television show. Pretty much what's happening here is that you are trying to create a movie which is a derivative right of another, you know, piece of content, be it book, newspaper, or something like that. So in that process alone, there are a couple of agreements that could be involved, including like option purchase agreements. Um, attachment agreement. Um, and then when that is done, and then the you call something the concept of packaging element, meaning that you're trying to get a writer to write the screenplay, you're trying to get a director to be attached to direct, you know, the movie, and you're also trying to get producers, you know all these things you call them the development process and of course you as a lawyer you're working you know i'm an external lawyer i work at a law firm so i'm working hand in hand with you know the legal affairs and business affairs of the studio and then those people are working also hand in hand with the creative like you know the folks that actually you know commission the screenplay read this the screenplay you know, trying to figure out like, oh, does it make sense to do this movie or not? And then that's what you call the development process. Now, development process can take months. Sometimes it could take years, you know. But then at some point, you get to a stage you call green light. And that's when the studio says, you know what? We're going to make this movie. Like, it, it makes sense. Let's go ahead and make it. Now, there are so many things involved, like, you know, in drafting the writer agreement, the director agreement, and the producer agreement. Um, here in Hollywood, because these people are members of the guild, you know, the union. So there are different rules and regulations that are involved in drafting the agreement. And then many of the studios are also um, signatories to the collective bargaining agreement between the studios they, they call themselves like the motion picture association of america and you know different guilds like the writers guild of america wga uh the directors guild of america and then the sag after 
which is um, Screen Actors Guild. Uh, they merged with AFTRA many years ago, uh, and then you know they called themselves SAG AFTRA, which covers actors. So, you know, those agreements talking about film are negotiated, and then um, when the studio decides to green light, and then you talk about production legal work. Now, for production legal work, it's usually like, um, um, let's say, you know, you're trying to find location. So you're doing location agreement. So it really comes handy with someone that has a real estate background. Um, let's say you have to actually improvise and build a set. So you have like the set decorator, set designer. So there's an agreement, you know, for that as well. Um, of course, you've already probably done the deal of the principal actors, like the marquee talent, um, the people that maybe like the four major or the principal actors, you know, for the movie, which under the side after it's like schedule, I think schedule F, you know, actors. Uh, but also there will be other actors who have like a less uh, roles, you know, involved in the movie. And then those kind of agreements are done during the production stage. Like there will be day actors, there will be, you know, weekly, you know, actors and all that. And um, all the other stuff that may come up, you know, whether it's uh, uh, appearance releases, um, like if you're going to feature somebody's logo, you know, prominently in a movie and it's not really like integrated into the movie, like it's not really directly related, you might need to, find, you know, get releases for that as well. I'm calling because I had, um, I recently had. Okay. So had once you finish, you know, pro production, you know, you have a movie in the can. And of course, there's the part when you start looking for distribution. Now, if it's the studio that's, you know, self-financing the movie, of course, the studio would, you know, distribute the movie. Uh, but then oftentimes in the independent, you know, film world, after a movie is in the can, you might actually have to start looking for distributors, you know, for your movie. Uh, you must have heard that people go to film festivals, like, you know, can. Uh, like um, Sundance Film Festival, Toronto International Film Festival, uh, Berlin Film Festival, like when, you know, they're looking for people who are distributors who are going to buy their movie. Also, this is kind of like really complex and we only have 20 minutes. Like in the independent film world, sometimes you might actually do something they call pre-sale. While uh, before you actually make the movie, you go to this film market and then you talk to different you know distributors and then you pre-sell the movie for different territories so let's say um your movie is going to cost like you know for independent film movie let's say you know between five hundred thousand dollars and um five million dollars and um you try to get financing for like 20 percent of that movie through pre-sale Meaning, let's say you go to Nigeria and then you go talk to who is the, like the biggest distributor in Nigeria right now. Um, I think is um, uh, what's their name? I'm blanking on their name right now. Um, and then you go to them and say, "Hey, let's say let's say Silverbird. I say Silverbird. I'm trying to make this movie. I'm going to pre-sell the Nigerian territory to you." for X amount of dollars. So let's say Silverbed says, you know what, we'll take $20,000. So that kind of like, you know, goes towards your budget. And then you pre-sale to Finland, you pre-sale to United Kingdom, to France, and you're able to get like, let's say $200,000 in pre-sale money. And usually that's a commitment from those people and saying, hey, we're going to buy this territory from you for X amount of dollars. And then you take that, agreements to the bank and then get a loan against it you know but that's like really like getting into the weeds on, on financing so let's fast forward again to distribution and then for distribution usually it's um you know it's pretty much a license because you're giving the studio 
you know, the rights to distribute and exploit the movie for a period of years, oftentimes it's like 20 to 25 years. And then, you know, they will pay a license fee or they pay something we call minimum guarantee or an advance, which is now like recoupable uh, from whatever money the, the movie makes. So that's what movie, you know, business look like, you know, and then, you know, we can talk more, like I'm sure people will have questions. Now, fast forward to uh, television. I mean, when I came to the state, I was just surprised about television. Like I didn't know what television business really looked like. I did, I did remember um, we, I mean, there were uh, television shows on NTA like during prime time that, you know, people just like to watch right before the nine o'clock news on NTA. And then of course, like, you know, there were many television shows on AIT, like local ones. And then right before I left Nigeria, and I think probably when I was in the university, there was this one about Paloma, like a couple of these um, um, Spanish, you know, television to like telenovelas that were very popular in Nigeria. Uh, so here, also with the advent of the s board platforms, like like the Netflix of this world, things have really really changed. But traditionally. Television in in Hollywood was kind of like distri like uh, distributed into different uh, genres and then different uh, television outlets that are making the movie. So you have these outlets you call the broadcast uh, television. So broadcast television is like the you know NBC, ABC, uh, CBS. So broadcast pretty much means like you can pretty much put an antenna out in front of your house and then you can receive signal. Like you don't have to really pay for it. You, you get it. So you call them free to hear broadcast. And then you have cable that you actually need subscription to be able to, to, to get the field, the, the feed. And then you, so you have, you have a uh, broadcast, you know, networks, you have the cable, and then you have the pay cable, um, which uh, like the HBO on Facebook, because you actually need, uh, you call them premium cable. You actually need like, you know, more subscription than a basic cable where you only pay like X amount of dollars to the cable, you know, service provider and you get access. But for the premium, you need more. And the difference here is just advertising. On broadcast TV, you get advertising, you know, commercials on it. On cable, same thing. But on premium cable, the HBO of this world, the stars of this world, you don't you don't get that, right? You know, because you you paid a premium to be able to see that. So in the broadcast world, usually you know, they call something like, you know, they call it a pilot season. And pilot season is usually like around April to June uh, when uh, talent, and talent here, I mean, actors are auditioning for roles in television because of what we call the fall start, meaning that when uh, the fall start is when uh, broadcast television, you know, companies, start uh, releasing new uh, television shows. And then, you know, some old television shows that are gonna come back, they will announce it. And people are always kind of like looking forward to that. They have this thing in New York where they call, which they call, um, oh my God, I'm blanking on the name now, where uh, people go and they, they watch uh, uh, these television shows that are about to be, you know, made and uh, you have the advertising companies, you know, different brands commit to those television companies like, oh, they're going to commit X amount of dollars in advertising money uh, 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 to, to, to the shows or to the, you know, television uh, network. Now, in terms of the deals that go on in television, 
it's kind of like similar to film in that there's always development. You know, everything starts with the development. Television shows can also be based on um, a film, a, a film, or um, a, a book, um, another television show in the past. And in fact, this happens a lot. Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with this television show on CBS. It, it's shown on CBS. I mean, on ABC here. It's called The Good Doctor. So The Good Doctor is actually based on a format from Korea you know, about a doctor that was autistic. So and many times like that, US shows are like that. Like they come from, they're based on like different formats that actually done well in overseas territory, you know, before they bring it to the US. It could also be based on a book. It could be based on somebody's life story. Like for example, Scandal is actually based on a woman who actually worked in the Bush administration and was known as a fixer. And then also there was this um, rumor that she might actually be involved, you know, with Bush uh, romantically. So, and this particular woman happened to be a black woman, you know, working in a white, you know, president's administration. So those are the things that kind of like inform, you know, development of a television show. So like I told you about the inverse pyramid, uh, lots of ideas at the beginning stage, and then it goes through the development process. And then you find out like only few shows are actually greenlit. So also in, in, in television, so what typically happens is that why producer is like the big name in film. And then you will notice like if you watch the Oscar show, Oscar awards, you notice that when they talk about the best picture, it's usually the producer or the producers that go to accept those awards. Uh, in television, it's the executive producer or showrunner. Uh, so oftentimes in starting a television show, if it's going to be based on an idea, of course, you get an option agreement, but also you need someone to actually run the show. So you call them the showrunner. So oftentimes it's this person that's called writer and executive producer. They came up with the idea. They are going to provide like the storyboard, how the idea is going to flow from season one to season seven. And that's when you actually have a successful show. Um, typically, these showrunners are also writers. So think of someone like uh, Shonda Rhimes, you know, is a very good example of a very successful showrunner. And then sometimes these showrunners may not actually write. Um, a good example, I'm sorry, blank, blanking on this person's name, but they were known for, if you watch shows like Chicago Fire, Chicago Medicine, or any of, any of those shows, uh, they they are known you know for that so they are called non-writing executive producer so oftentimes when you have situations like these and the creative of the studio are like oh we're going to run with this you know guy or this woman because they're writer executive producers and we love this idea that they pitch to us so you negotiate the writer executive producer uh, agreement with them and then typically it's just also because everything is guild related and many of the studios here in America actually signatory to the guild uh, agreement. It's um, all about like, you know, this person's gonna write, uh, you know, how much they're gonna get paid, how much are they gonna receive in back end, um, uh, are they gonna get royalty, uh, what's gonna be their level of approval, you know, how much approval rights are we giving them? Uh, consultation rights we're giving them, are they going to get royalty? Um, and then also, if there's a spin off to the show, are they going to be attached you know, to render services on that? So you call that first opportunity, right? Then if they're not attached to it, do they also get like, you know, passive participation you know, uh, uh, so that they can just move ahead and you know, the show continues to do great? And then next to that, you have the pilot director agreement. Now, the writer executive producer can also be the pilot director because oftentimes you have that, you know, people you call multi IP in it. Um, and then, you know, they do all these things. But then the pilot director is actually very, very important. Why? Because the person that directs the pilot is like, 
uh, I mean, the pilot is very, very important in the life of a television show. If the pilot is good, it could actually drive the success of the show. And then if you pay attention to the credit, you will notice that sometimes, in fact, most times, the director of a pilot or the first episode is different from the director of other episodes, you know, uh, on the movie. Because like each episode of a movie is like a movie, I mean, sorry, of a television show, it's like a movie in itself. And then sometimes you could actually have an episode of a movie that has uh, similar budgets as a, a big time movie. So a good example would be HBO's, um, oh my God, I don't know why I'm blanking on this name. So there was this show on HBO that was very, very popular, you know, about dragons and, and stuff like that. And everybody watched like all over the world. Uh, you could have budgets like running into millions and millions of dollars, like hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so, and then you have, you know, I, I talk about the writer executive producer agreement, you have the pilot director agreement, and then you have the non-writing producer agreement, you know, uh, also like, you know, different, you know, levels of, of producer, because typically in the television world, uh, writers are very very important and then you have like different caters you know for those writers so oftentimes you start out as a staff writer and then you move on to be a story editor and then you move on to be an executive story editor and then you become a supervising producer and then after that you become a producer and then you become a co-producer and then you become an executive producer and um and then you become executive producer showrunner so that's the way it works like in the television world. And of course, like when things go into production, like all those things that I discussed earlier regarding uh, film, like, you know, set decoration, uh, location management, you know, same thing that you would typically have in a movie. Like, you know, you have a UPM or unit production manager that's kind of like helping, you know, draw out the budget. Uh, a couple of things are usually involved in the process of green lighting a movie. Uh, because like studios sell to each other and then independent companies also sell to studios at different times. So it's a question of like, typically here, when you sell to a broadcast network, you're selling at a deficit. Uh, they call it deficit financing, meaning that um, you're going to license the show to a broadcast network and then the broadcast network will pay 60% of the budget. And then, you know, you have a deficit of 40%. So pretty much like the show is not generating money um, in the first few years, usually season one and season two, it's at a deficit. So season one, 60%, season two, it increases to 70%, season three increases to, to 80%. And then by the time it gets to season three, season four, when by that time, it, also this is more, it's very technical. We only have very few minutes to talk about this. Um, uh, by the time you get to three seasons, you probably have like 100 episodes because back then, you know, broadcast network will order like, you know, 20 to 25 episodes a season. So think of Friends, think of Big Bang Theory, think of uh, General Hospital, or think of um, uh, this uh, Grey's Anatomy, you know. Uh, so, you know, it works like that. And then by the time you get to season three, season four, then studio will start paying like 100% of the budget. Now, that, that's interesting because what happens is like the, as a producer or the production company or the studio that's actually uh, licensing the movie to the network, I mean, sorry, the television show to the network, you actually uh, retain the rights to sell internationally. So to sell to Africa, to Nigeria, to South Africa, to all these, uh, to other territories so that you make up the, the deficit. But then with the advent of the subscription video on demand like Netflix, so you have this thing they call the cost plus, meaning that the Netflix of this world will actually finance the entire budget. So they will pay 100% of it, and then they will give you what we call a premium on top. And then a premium is usually between 15% to 25%. So they cover your production costs, and then they give you uh, 25. Let's say your production cost is like, $10 million uh, or, you know, $500,000 per episode. So they will pay the entire amount and then they will put like 20 to 25% on top for you. So 
in broadcast when you would have you are taking you like a longer time to make your money back you kind of like make it back straight away you know on shows you know on netflix but then you know it's like carrot in the stick because what happens is like you know you're giving out rights oftentimes the rights can be for longer period um because they already paid out you know your money and then you can you know for, as a business person you focus on cash flow so you can you know use that money to you know go do other things um and of course because like for television it's you're selling to a network uh so you could you know depending on how you structure the deal you know it's a co-production deal or it's an outright like i'm licensing to this network it could be exclusive it could be non-exclusive it could be for a particular territory or it could be for you know all over the world like if you do an s word deal um i think i will stop here like i've already like that today the 20 minute mark so if anybody has any questions exactly, let me exactly know. 30 minutes oh i'm sorry <laughs> Fine, fine. Thank you very much. Because we see that like there are a lot of Netflix deals going on and all that. So it's good to know what exactly happens in the background and how all these things play. Um, quickly before we go to the Q and A, I would like to call Rita to just make a five minutes presentation and then we'll go straight to Q and A. Rita. Good evening, everyone. My name is Rita Otayo. I'll be doing a five-minute presentation on television. This image Rita, I think you can just continue while we're waiting for your slides. Okay. All right. Um, okay, television. No. Okay, on production. Okay, on television. No. Television no is an aspect of we tell that mothers on television will cast you. Television, as we all know, is probably the most cost-effective platform for informing, educating, and entertaining people all over the globe. Why broadcasting serves the purpose of transmitting programs or signals intended to be received by the public through radio, television, or similar means. Okay, on you know, broadcasting. Broadcasting means communication to the public by any means of wireless diffusion, whether in any one or more of the forms of signs, sound, or visual images, or by wire, and it includes a rebroadcast. A broadcast, therefore, is any sound, image, or combination of sounds and images transmitted by a broadcasting service provider and received sim sim simultaneously by the public. Okay. On the laws regulating television broadcast in Nigeria, one of the laws regulating television broadcast is the Nigerian Broadcasting Commission Act. One of the laws, yeah, the Nigerian Broadcasting Commission Act. It actually regulates the broadcasting sector in Nigeria. The act empowers the commission to Yes, the Act empowers the Commission, that is the Nigerian Broadcasting Commission, to regulate, control the broadcasting industry. And this quality includes all processes for the establishment of television networks and all applications bordering on grants of license. We quality have the NBC code. The NBC code actually regulates the minimum standard for broadcasting in Nigeria. We have the Companies and Allied Matters Act. The Companies and Allied Matters Act reg regulates the process of incorporation of broadcasting organizations and also all operations as it relates to karma. Then as to other laws, we probably have other laws that protect the IP rights of, the IP rights of broadcasting organization 
this have to do with trademark, patents, and copyright act. The copyright act is seeks to protect the copyright of majorly the content, the content or the copyrighted work being broadcast by broadcasting organizations. Why the trademark? It protect the identity or the brand of broadcasters ranging from their logos, their symbols, or anything that distinguishes the services of one broadcaster to the other. We call it how the Patent Act, it protects, the, it protects new inventions or, or products produced by broadcasting organizations. And this act equally aid in excluding all other broadcasters from commercially exploiting them. Then next slide. Okay, talking about the rights of broadcasting organization. Broadcasting organizations are granted rights which are referred to as neighboring rights. Okay, what are neighboring rights? Neighboring rights are the rights accorded to such organizations who present organizations like the broadcasting organizations that present creative works into authors to the public but are not regarded as creators in their own rights. Neighboring rights can equally be referred to as related rights. The protection of neighboring rights of a broadcaster in no way affects the exercise of copyright, exercise of, of copyright as the owner of a copyrighted work can exercise the exclusive rights over such work. Okay, the beneficiaries of this right the beneficiaries of this neighboring rights here are broadcasting service providers. Basically, they are organizations that engage in broadcasting business and such organizations as provided by the MBC Act that are required to obtain license from yeah before commencing such business. Okay, so what are the businesses these organizations carry out? What constitutes broadcasting business? We have the terrestrial broadcasting. This actually is, is a type of broadcasting in which television signal is transmitted from the earth-based trans transmitter of a television station to a TV receiver using an antenna. We have a cable television broadcasting. This, in this case, they operate a system that distributes television signal by means of cable. We call it have satellite broadcasting. Is a distribution of broadcast signal using a satellite network. Then the rights of a broadcaster. A broadcaster, that is a broadcasting organization, has the right to broadcast, broadcast. Equally, has the right to broadcast. He has causes the broadcast to be heard or seen by the public on payment of any charges equally makes any sound recording or visual recording of the broadcast and equally have the right to make any reproduction of such sound recording or visual recording. Then on the protection, the next slide borders on the protection of broadcasters' rights when copyright exists in a broadcast content. First, on the protection, when the broadcaster is also the producer or the owner of the work, by virtue of either an assignment or a license of the brokers. Talking about an assignment here, a broadcasting organization. Sorry, please, my slide. We can still see your slide, Rita. I've spent like eight minutes. Oh, oh, oh. okay, let me just. Okay, on the protection of broker signal. The protection of broker signal. Broker signal can be protected by prohibition, prohibition of the manufacture or sale of devices that is used for the for decoding broker signal and the transmission or the viewing and listening of those signals without authorization. And equally prohibits the act of transmission of the broker signals. Then we are looking at the the role of IP lawyers in television law practice. IP lawyers in 
television law practice. They can actually assist clients by drafting agreements. Agreements in this sense is actually the responsibility of, of a such lawyer to ensure that he actually protect the IP rights, ensure that each agreement, the agreement he drafts for his client, actually protect the IP rights of his client. Same should be reflected in that agreement. For instance, now, and the no disclosure clause, you should ensure that such clauses and clauses that protect the IP rights of his clients are, are reflected in agreements he drafts for his clients. And equally on obtaining licensing and also other regulations. And also an IP lawyer in this field can actually can, can equally assist broadcasting organizations to obtain their, to register their trademarks and also ensure protection of copyrights and all other rights associated, associated with IP. Then it can fully advise on matters from the creation and development of content to the finance and the distribution of state. And it can equally advise content creators, presenters on deals with production companies for television programs. I think this is my last slide. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Rita, for the presentation. Um, thank you for taking the time to research and also to present. Um, so we'll just go straight to the Q&A section. If you have a question, please just unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, so we'll just give about 30 seconds for anybody to make up their mind if they have a question. While we wait for... My name is Mama. I have a question. The question is if the movie, for example, if an adaptation of an existing work and the producer comes and signs an agreement to secure the right to use the material to produce the film, after the film is finished and the copyright owner is not trained, yet, how can he enforce? Okay, thank you very much. The moment. Do we have any more questions? Okay, we don't have any more. Okay. Okay, so I guess that her question is in the chat box. So Mr. Shegun, you can also check it. Then Grace also asked some questions that are already in the chat box. What is the difference between broadcasting and transmission? What is the difference between open television and cable television? Does cable television mean digital and can NTA, AIT, channels, ETC be classified under open television? And I think maybe she's saying cable television, I'm not too sure. Then if yes, then how do these television stations that have gone digital adhere to the 60% local content for open television and 20% local content for cable television mandate of the MBC Act. So I think since nobody has indicated again, I think these are the questions. Over to you, Mr. Shegun. Um, so I'll start with Umomot's uh, question. So if movies and adaptation of an existing work and producer con concluded and signed an agreement to secure the right to use the material to produce the film, after the film is made and the copyright owner is not paid the agreed fee, how can he enforce his rights, especially in Nigeria? I mean, pretty much like this, this is very fundamental. Like, you know, it's a breach of contract um, because like, you know, the parties agreed that the uh, owner of the of the work is going to be paid by by the producer, right? And then the producer failed to to pay the fee. Uh, the good thing here is that you know from your fact pattern is that you know there was an agreement, right? And then if there was an agreement in place and you have all the elements of the contract, you know, offer, acceptance, consideration, and um, uh, the the other party defaults. Of course, like you have all the remedies, you know, at law uh, regarding a breach of contract. So you can definitely sue uh, for for damages. Uh, you can also, I mean, depending on, on on the contract, sometimes like when you do a deal like this, there's always a waiver of, of uh, equitable 
remedies like injunction and stuff like that. So if there's no waiver of that in the contract, you can definitely sue, you know, for an infringement. I mean, sorry, for an injunction uh, because like, you know, they, they, they fail to pay. I mean, you could probably also make a, a, a case for infringement because infringement is an unauthorized uh, use of, of some of this work. And if, you know, the authorization is based on the contract and then they fail to perform uh, their obligations in the contract, which is, which is to pay you, uh, you probably can also, you know, sue for that. So th those are the, I believe the mechanism, you know, for enforcing the rights, you know, depending on what you guys agree to, it could be, you know, just going straight to the court or if the, um, the, the, the dispute resolution mechanism in the agreement uh, provides that you guys go to arbitration, you might have to, to do that. Um, I hope that answers your question, Umar Mark. Okay, so moving on to the question from Grace. So what is the difference between broadcasting and transmission? I don't know if this is like specific to the provisions of the Nigerian Broadcasting Code or the Nigerian Communications Act. Uh, but, you know, just speaking generally, you know, uh, broadcasting pretty much is like, you know, um, transmitting uh, feed, you know, through the, you know, the, the, the hair waves, like, you know, through whatever spectrum, you know, is provided under the Nigerian Broadcasting Code, you know, and um, of course, like it all started with like, you know, broadcasting over the hair, you know, broadcast or what you call free to hair, you know, broadcast, and all you need is just an antenna and you should be able to get to get it. So I, I don't think there's any difference between broadcasting and transmission, but Rita gave an excellent presentation. So maybe she can speak uh, to that, to the extent that there's actually specific concepts uh, in the law uh, regarding the, I, I don't think there's a difference, but you know I would defer to Rita on that. Um, in terms of the difference between open television and cable television, Again, I don't know if this is, you know, specific to the broadcasting code, but what I was saying during my presentation was that, you know, you have the broad, like here in America, you, you call them the broadcast television. Why? Because like I said earlier, they're, they're free to hear, like you can just put an antenna up and then you get it. And then cable television, usually, you know, you have a set top box. So think of, um, I know in Nigeria, you actually have satellite, um, but I think they're cable service providers, not like Star TV or something, or Star Times uh, TV. So pretty much like you need like a set top box to be able to receive the feed, or you need a satellite dish to be able to receive the feed. And then for you to do that, you actually need to pay a subscription fee to be able to get that, that feed. I think we have just three minutes to go, right? So let me quickly run to it. Then does cable television mean digital? and can NTA, AIT, EDC be classified under open television? Yeah, so digital is different. So digital could mean a couple of things. I know that, you know, um, many, many years ago when uh, Professor Akinuli was the Minister of Communications, um, there was this thing about um, moving Nigeria from analog to digital. So I don't know if that's what your question is trying to address, so if you're, so digital pretty, it's pretty much like the broadcasting feed, like whereby you actually need um, like a digital capable television sets to be able to receive uh, those digital transmission. And digital transmission is not even only limited to TV. So also in, for radio, you have like HD, high definition um, uh, digital transmission. Um, I don't know if that's what your question was, Kind of like relating to so di digital transmission can come through cable television or broadcast television you know it, it's pretty much the feed that the television platform is transmitting to people and people will have uh, capabilities like they have devices that are capable of receiving those digital uh, transmission can can then receive it so 
it's more of like, you know, it used to be analog, but now it's digital. So cable television, like I said earlier, is pretty much like you need to set up boxes to be able to receive those feed. Um, can NTA AIT channels it is be classified as open television? Yeah, if open television means like free to hear broadcast, you know, network, then the answer is yes. Because for NTA, you pretty much don't need a set top box to receive it, to receive the feed. All you need is an, is a, um, an antenna. Same thing for AIT and channels. But then this is the interesting thing in Nigeria. I know that you can also get channels AIT on DSTV. So typically here in the US, um, those television companies are actually paid by the cable service providers for them to broadcast their feed, right? So they pay them a couple of cents. Like for example, uh, if I remember correctly, um, if you have ESPN, you know, on your subscription, about $2 from this subscriber fee is paid to ESPN, right? Because here, here in America, there, there are a couple of ways in which television companies make money. So you have something they call the retransmission fee, pretty much meaning that, so a close example to that would be like NTA, but if NTA was a private, was a private company, whereby NTA as a network will have owned and operated television stations, but then they have some, some other companies that are called affiliates. So affiliates like you have uh, independent uh, television companies that pretty much have television stations like all over the country. And then they enter into an affiliate agreement uh, with the network in order to transmit their, their production. Because like here in the States, like you have a limit on how many television stations you can actually own in different territories because they don't want anybody to have monopoly over it. So just imagine NTA like owning the network and then entering into different affiliation agreements with like different companies that own television stations across the country. So you, you get uh, advertising money, which is shared between the network and those affiliates. And then you also get something called retransmission fee. So retransmission fee, the way it works is like whatever uh, television platform is taking that feed, you know, from the network, they, they pay a retransmission fee, uh, you know, for that. And then for cable, most times the way cable make money is through subscription because, you know, they share in the money that the cable service uh, provider gets from their subscribers. And then each television cable television network will get a certain percentage of that money. Some people will get 20 cents. Let's say Oprah Winfrey Network, for example, probably gets like 20 cents from every money received by the cable service provider from the subscribers. And a company like CNN probably get $1. And let's say the subscriber is paying for the entire package, uh, $50 to $100. So that's how it works here in the US. And a good, uh, um, Parallel would be like if NTA was privatized. So keep in mind that in the UK, the way it works is like, you know, uh, the, the, the people of the UK are actually taxed uh, to watch television. So you actually pay a tax to the government in order to finance BBC because BBC is a, is a public service, right? Now that's different in ways where uh, companies like Sky uh, operate who are more like, you know, a cable service provider or satellite, you know, service provider that you actually need a set top box in order to get their feed. So I don't know if that answers your question. So you said then how do these television stations that have gone digital adhere to the 60% local content for open television and 20% content for cable television? Now, I don't know that question at all. So I would defer to Rita. And I think uh, Flo might actually have an answer for that uh, than I do. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Shegun. Thank you, thank you, thank you for answering the question and getting to that point. And that's so, that's really what we need in this world, honesty. Um, thank you so much. So let's just move to Mr. Folarian. I'm sure he might have some things to add, and then we'll also take a comment from Mrs. Uche before we close for you. 
Okay. Thank you very much, Juliana, and thank you, Shekou, for a uh, fantastic intervention. As as always, uh, Shekou never disappoints. Uh, I, I don't have much ado. Uh, I, I should say fantastic lineup uh, of speakers from Emmanuel talking about game gaming uh, to Kelvin, who I think I've read about. This is the first time where I'm actually seeing him virtually, or at least watching him speak. And then to Shegu, and of course, all the mentees. So fantastic stuff. Well done. I think with regards to Emmanuel, one thing that I have followed, like the transition of technology and in broadcasts and in well, technology generally, Shah, in entertainment. I, I think most, most, scholars believe that the the development that we've seen in in um, television technology so that's tv screens has since the 80s has been largely due to the or rather technology has improved in television um, screen resolution you know tv technology has improved largely because of the gaming industry uh, globally, and I, I think the need for higher resolution TVs for um, televisions that do all sorts of things that can connect to the internet, you know, and blah blah blah, have uh, by gamers, by people in who game, uh, who play video games, you know, has actually pushed the the envelope for um, TV TV design. TV technology, etc., and and I think that's one area that you know one should also look at uh, as a means to drive development in Nigeria locally. So you know the the it, it's interesting how a demand in one area of of uh, well, what you may call sports, you know. A demand in one area affects, you know, supply in another area. Um, and uh, I think Emmanuel made reference to some high-end computer systems that are sold to gamers. I somebody came to my office about two weeks ago with an Alienware computer, you know, very high-end, top of the market specs, you know, that are used by gamers and graphics designers the person actually of course plays fifa and all the other games you know but the person is also a, a video editor you know, so it's quite interesting when one looks at the interplay of, of forces and of course u.s copyright law has largely been driven by innovation in um in, in yeah in broadcasts um i i remember reading a few Yes, I think I, I, I remember it in a transcript from um, I think from the eighties, transcript of a debate surrounding uh, what what was what we now refer to as um, recorded TV, but then it was referred to as well, I think the Betamax system was used to record live TV and then watch later on um, some special specialized tapes. So it. it that concept was, was really was revolutionary at the time, and it was believed that it would impact the the system. The um, the it would it was an infringement of, on the copyright of the big movie studios, well, of movie creators, and that it would upset the economy of the entertainment industry. You know, but it's interesting nowadays. People do, you know, you can do screen capture, you know, and whatever. But the, the idea is that innovation in one area or demand in one area affects innovation in another area. So I'm, I'm quite interested to see how that plays out, especially with regards to gaming in Nigeria. Um, fantastic conversation. Shema. I think that there's a lot of value to be added to, there's a lot, there's a lot more to be done in terms of our, you know, uh, television and movie industry. I agree that Nollywood 
is the is it the third largest now in terms of output volume but there's a huge need to focus more on quality you know and i don't just mean quality in terms of the quality of the of the finished product but in terms of quality of writing um, and then so that's script, <coughs> excuse me script writing um, and then the production process itself Shegu talked about independent producers or independent um, independent producers and distinction between the big studios big blockbuster production productions and when you look at the credits you find that there's oh yes co-production treaty you find that in you find that the, the 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 production process actually is quite extensive we i don't know many nollywood productions have have um, improved in terms of quality in terms of you know writing but we, there are still other places we have there are so many stories that have been unexplored but, you know in terms of uh, the in the african context when you want when you know when you, when you dig deeper into our cultural history our cultural um, our cultural heritage the, the the black panther was a thing because of the its connection to africa you know but there are, if if you were to look at the the various ethnicities and their various uh, creation stories and myths and stories about you know progenitors there's a lot more that can be uh, that can be mined from there so i think there's a lot of content that nollywood can use you know to uh, to push to push nigeria as a brand and i posted something about i i think the conversation around the digitalization analog shagun talked about satellite set up boxes and all that so the idea is to transition from terrestrial broadcast where you just stick a hanger outside your window and pick signals to digital transmission so it's the signal generation distribution and reception that is quote and unquote digi digital digi digitized and digitalized but in all thank you very much Shago. thank you everybody well done again um okay thank you very much mr for lying. um so we'll just call mrs uche to give our comments before we close for today. Well, thank you so much, Juliana. But then, what can you add when you've heard from uh, Shegu and Luka? I, I guess it's best to leave it with the um, experts in that field, except that I will just simply add that we subscription, because he did mention that the way that uh, these um, um, television networks make money is through subscription and um, perhaps advertisement as well. But it's, it would be advisable to keep in mind that when you subscribe or when they offer you free uh, trial period, they're actually collecting your data and the data subject is really parting with information, all your details, uh, so it's not free in a way because they get something in return. And um, you would have experienced that with Netflix, sometimes they even suggest to you uh, likely movies because they studied your behavior and then your viewing behavior. So all of those are the things that are put out there. And then on the open TV and cable TV, I think that the experience I had with NTA once was that NTA was on cable. But then the NTA you see as open TV is not as rich. That's my experience. I don't know whether it, it still happens, but I was scrolling down and when that happened, I was like, you know, they put it as part of the package, like Shego rightly said, and gave an example of um, owned by Oprah, Oprah Winfrey Network and cable, uh, CNN, the different uh, payment that is made to them. 
So I believe that for NTA really to stay in business, they needed to be in cable. So no matter, maybe they pay them so little, but then I couldn't really access NTA at one time in cable. And uh, but the open one was just like, if you watch, maybe all you get is the news. So I don't know if it's still the case. That's my two cents because these are the experts. So I, I've really, really gained value listening to them. So thank you so much for your time today and to Shego and every other person that has spoken. Thanks. Okay, I think I was muted. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mrs. Uche. Thank you for always coming. Thank you for contributing. And I forgot to say that you're looking good. Yeah, I like your hair specifically. Then I'll move oh, over. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you then. Mr. Folari, thank you so much. Thank you for always coming. Thank you for being there, for always putting a cap on, on a lot of things and um, telling us how things are in the IP space also. Thank you very much then to Mr. Shego and Luko. Thank you so much. I just sent him a message and he read it and he was like, okay, he will do this. And I'm so excited. Thank you. I read about you online and I see that you are such a big deal. And for you to take out your time this morning to come and talk to us, I sincerely appreciate your time and all that you've said. Thank you very much. Thank you to Mr. Emmanuel in absentia. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Shego. Thank you to Mr. Emmanuel in absentia. He actually spoke about esports the passion everything he was saying thank you thank you to mr kelvin and thank you to all the mentees that have been here and stayed up till this time i hope that we go and still listen to this because for me i learn mostly in silence so if i go back to my house and i'm in complete silence i will try to listen to this again so that it can sink in thank you so much everyone have an amazing weekend bye thank you bye when you listen, please share with us because knowledge is good. We also want to learn, please. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, everyone.